Hello. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to be reading the next chapter of The Little People. So uh, we're up to chapter 17 now. And uh, the last chapter, I asked some questions. So let's see how you got on with the question, shall we? So first question was, what does Mrs. Driver first see as she comes down the stairs? So Mrs. Driver creeps down the stairs in the middle of the night because she hears a noise. And she sees something flickering on the floor. So she sees a candle. So boy has taken the candle downstairs. Okay, so that was the answer to question number one. Question number two, what did Mrs. Driver do when she saw the little people? So floor was opened up, there's a candle by the side, the boy had disappeared, and she could see little people running around. She screamed, she jumped on the kitchen table and screamed. <laughs> and then question number three, what was the last thing Mrs Driver took out of the hole in the floor? So she picks out all of the old homily and Arietti's treasures and their lovely furniture and their homemade beautiful things and she thinks it's just rubbish and she scoops them all out puts them in two piles like the valuable things and the rubbish that she calls rubbish and then the last thing was the emerald watch which is when she says the police said mrs driver that's what this means a case for the police so big troubles Okay, so yeah, just to recap from the last time, Mrs. Driver creeps down at midnight and sees the boards in the kitchen have been moved. She pulls back the boards and sees the borrower's house and the borrowers who run away while she's screaming. And when Mrs. Driver gets all their things out of the hole, she sees the Emerald Watch and says she's going to call the police. Right, so let's see what happens, shall we? The boy lay trembling a little beneath the bedclothes. The screwdriver was under his mattress. He had heard the alarm clock. He had heard Mrs. Driver exclaim on the stairs and he had run. The candle on the table behind his bed still smelt a little and the wax must still be warm. He lay there waiting, but they did not come upstairs. After hours, it seemed, he heard the hall clock strike one. All seemed quiet below, and at last he slipped out of bed and crept along the passage to the head of the stairway. There he sat for a while, shivering a little and gazing downwards into the darkened hall. There was no sound but the steady tick, tick of the clock, and occasionally that shuffled a whisper, which might be the wind, but which, as he knew, was the sound of the house itself, the sigh of the tired floors and the ache of knotted wood. So quiet it was that at last he found courage to move and to tiptoe down the staircase and along the kitchen passage. He listened a while outside the baize door and at length, very gently, pushed it open. The kitchen was silent and filled with greyish darkness. He felt, as Mrs Driver had done, along the shelf for the matches and he struck a light. He saw the gaping hole in the floor and the objects piled beside it, and in the same flash he saw a candle on the shelf. He lit it clumsily with trembling hands. Yes, there they lay, the contents of the little home, higgledy-piggledy on the boards, and the tongs lay beside them. Mrs Driver had carried away all she considered valuable and had left the rubbish. And rubbish it looked, <coughs> Sorry. thrown down like this. Balls of wool, old potatoes, odd pieces of doll's furniture, matchboxes, cotton reels, crumpled squares of blotting paper. He knelt down. The house itself was a shambles. Partitions fallen, earth floors revealed, where, pod, where pod had dug down to give greater height to the rooms. Matchsticks, an old cog wheel, onion skins, scattered bottle tops. The boy stared blinking his eyelids and tilting the candle so that the grease ran hot on his hand. 
Then he got up from his knees and crossing the kitchen on tiptoe, he closed the scullery door. He came back to the hole and leaning down, he called softly, Arietti, Arietti. After a while, he called again. Something fell hot on his hand. It was a tear from his eye. Angrily, he brushed it away and leaning further into the hole, he called once more, Pud, he whispered, Homily. They appeared so quietly that at first, in the wavering light of the candle, he did not see them. Silent they stood, looking up at him with scared white faces from what had been the passage outside the storerooms. Where have you been? asked the boy. Pod cleared his throat. <clears throat> up at the end of the passage, under the clock. I've got to get you out, said the boy. Where, where to? asked Pod. I don't know. What's, what's about the attic? That ain't no good, said Pod. I heard them talking. They're going to get the police and the cat and the sanitary inspector and the rat catcher from the town all at Leighton Buzzard. They were all silent. Little eyes stared at big eyes. There won't be nowhere in the house that's safe, Pod said at last. And no one moved. What about the doll's house on the top shelf in the schoolroom? suggested the boy. Even a cat can't get there. Homily gave a little moan of assent. Oh, yes, she said, the doll's house. No, said Pod in the same expressionless voice. You can't live on a shelf. Maybe the cat can't get up, but no more can't you get down. You're stuck. You've got to have water. I'd bring you water, said the boy. He touched the pile of rubbish. And there are a beds and things here. No, said Potter. Shelf ain't no good. Besides, you'll be going soon, or so they say. Oh, Pod, pleaded Homily in a husky whisper. There's stairs in the doll's house, and two bedrooms, and a dining room, and a kitchen, and a bathroom, she said. But it's up by the ceiling, Pod exclaimed wearily. You gotta eat, haven't you? he asked. And drink? Yes, Pod, I know, but there ain't no buts, said Pod. He drew a long breath. We gotta emigrate, he said. Oh, moaned Homily softly, and Arietti began to cry. Now don't take on, said Pod in a tired voice. Arietti had covered her face with her hands, and her tears ran through her fingers. The boy, watching, saw them glisten in the candlelight. I'm not taking on, she gasped. <coughs> I'm so happy, happy. You mean, said the boy to Pod, but with one eye on Arietti, you'll go to the badger set. He too felt a mounting excitement. Where else, asked Pod. Oh, my goodness gracious, moaned Homily, and she sat down on the broken matchbox chest of drawers. But you've got to go somewhere tonight, said the boy. You've got to go somewhere before tomorrow morning. Oh, my goodness gracious, moaned Homily again. He's right at that, said Pod. Can't cross them fields in the dark. Bad enough getting across them in daylight. I know, cried Arietti. Her wet face glistening in the candlelight. It was a light and tremulous, and she raised her arms a little, as though about to fly, as she swayed, as she balanced on her tiptoed toe tits. Let's go to the doll's house just for tonight, and tomorrow, she closed her eyes against the brightness of the vision, tomorrow the boy will take us, take us, and she could not say to where. Take us, cried Homily in a strange, hollow voice. How? In his pocket, chanted Arietti. Won't you? Again, she swayed with lightened, upturned face. Yes, he said, and, and bring the luggage up afterwards in a fish basket. Oh, my goodness, moaned Homily. I'll pick all the furniture out of this pile here, or most of it. They'll hardly notice, and, and anything else you want. Tea murmured homily enough for our lifetimes all right said the boy i get a pound of tea and and coffee too if you like and cooking pots and matches you'll be all right he said but, but what 
do they eat? wailed Homily. Caterpillars? Now, Homily, said Pod, don't be foolish. Loopy was always a good manager. But Loopy isn't there, said Homily. Berries? Do they eat berries? How do they cook out at doors? Now, Homily, said Pod, we'll see to all that when we get there. I could light a fire of sticks, said Homily. Not in the wind. What if it rains, she asked. How do they cook in the rain? Now, Homily, began Pod. He was beginning to lose patience, but Homily rushed on. Could you get us a couple of tins of sardines to take, she asked the boy, and, and some salt, and some candles, and matches, and could you bring us the carpets from the doll's house? Yes, said the boy, I could. Of course I could. Anything you want. All right, said Homily. She still looked wild, partly because some of her hair had rolled out of the curlers, but she seemed appeased. How are you going to get us upstairs? Up to the schoolroom? The boy looked down at his pocketless nightshirt. I'll carry you, he said. How, said Homily. In your hands? Yes, said the boy. I'd rather die, said Homily. I'd rather stay right here and be eaten by the rat catcher from the town hall at Leighton Buzzard. The boy looked round the kitchen. He seemed to be bewildered. Shall I carry you in the peg bag, he asked at last, seeing it hanging in its usual place on the handle of the scullery door. All right, said Homily. Take out the pegs first. But she walked into it, bravely enough, when he laid it out on the floor. It was soft and floppy and made of woven raffia. When he picked it up, Homily shrieked and clung to Pod and Ariete. Oh! And she gasped as the bag swayed a little. Oh, I can't! Stop it! Put me out! Oh! Oh! And clutching and slipping, they fell into a tangle at the bottom. Be quiet, Homily, can't you? explained Pod angrily and held her tightly by the ankle. It was not easy to control her as he was lying on his back with his face pushed forward on his chest and one leg held upright by the side of the bag, somewhere above his head. Ariete climbed up away from them, clinging to the knots of the raffia, and looked out over the edge. Oh, I can't, I can't, cried Homily. Stop it, Pod, I'm dying. Tell him to put us down. Put us down, said Pod in his patient way, just for a moment. That's right, on the floor. And as once again the bag was placed beside the hole, they all ran out. Look here, said the boy, unhappily to Homily. You've got to try. She'll try, all right, said Pod. Give her a breather and take it slower, if you see what I mean. All right, agreed the boy. But there isn't much time. Come on, he said, nervously. Hop in. Listen, cried Pod sharply, and froze. The boy, looking down, saw their three upturned faces catching the light. Like pebbles, they looked still and stony against the darkness within the hole, and then in a flash they were gone. The boards were empty and the hole was bare. He leaned into it. Pod, he called in a frantic whisper. Homily, come back! And then he too became frozen, stooped and rigid above the hole. The scullery door creaked open behind him. It was Mrs. Driver. She stood there, silent this time in her nightdress, Turning, the boy stared up at her. Hello, he said uncertainly after a moment. She did not smile, but something lightened in her eyes. A malicious gleam, a look of triumph. She carried a candle which shone upwards on her face, streaking it strangely with light and shadow. What are you doing down here? she asked. He stared at her, but he did not speak. Answer me, she said, and what are you doing with the peg bag? Still, he stared at her, almost stupidly. The, the, the peg bag, he repeated, and looked down, as though surprised to see it in his hand. Nothing, he said. Was it you who put the watch in that hole? No, he said, staring up at her again. It was there already. Ah, she said and smiled. So you knew it was there? No. He said, I mean, yes. Do you know what you are? 
asked Mrs. Driver, watching him closely. You are a sneaking, thieving, noxious little dribbit of no good. His face quivered. Why? he asked. You know why. You're a wicked, black-hearted, fribbling little pickpocket. That's what you are. And so are they. They're nasty, crafty, scampy, scurvy, squeaking little... No, they're not, he put in quickly. And you're in league with them. She came across to him and, taking him by the upper arm, she jerked him to his feet. You know what they do with thieves, she asked. No, he said. They lock them up. That's what they're going to do with thieves. And that's what's going to happen to you. I'm not a thief, cried the boy, his lips trembling. I'm a borrower. A what? She swung him round by tightening the grip on his arm. A, a borrower, he repeated. There were tears in his eyelids. He hoped they would not fall. So that's what you call it, she exclaimed. As he himself had done so long ago, it seemed now. That day with Arietti. That's their name, he said. The kind of people they are. They're, they're borrowers. Borrowers, eh? repeated Mrs. Driver wonderingly. She laughed. Well, they've done all the borrowing they're ever going to do in this house. She began to drag him towards the door. The tears spilled over his eyelids and ran down his cheeks. Don't hurt them, he begged. I'll move them, I promise. I know how. Mrs. Driver laughed again and pushed him roughly through the green baize door. He'll be moved, all right, she said. Don't worry. The rat catcher will know how. Crampfell's old cat will know how. So will the sanitary inspector and the fire brigade, if need be. The police will know how, I shouldn't wonder. No need to worry about moving them. Once you've found the nest, she went on, dropping her voice to a vicious whisper as they passed Aunt Sophie's door, the rest is easy. She pushed him into the schoolroom and locked the door and he heard the boards of the passage creak beneath her tread as, satisfied, she moved away. He crept into bed then because he was cold and cried his heart out under the blankets. Poor boy. He's very sad now, isn't he? <gasps> Goodness, that was dramatic, wasn't it? So, Mrs. Driver's found a secret knows all about the borrowers. It's going to be trouble. So, questions for next time. <coughs> Let's think back to the chapter we've just read. So, question number one. What does the boy do when he hears Mrs. Driver coming? He hears her creeping up the passage. Okay. And then question number two. Where does Pod say they have to go? There's a lot of talk about where they're going to go. But Pod finally says they have to go somewhere. And number three, what did the boy get to carry them in? When he tried to take them, he got something and they climbed into it and he tried to take them. So what was that? Good luck with the questions and um, I'll hopefully see you next time. Bye-bye for now.